Well, folks, um, <laughs> welcome to the 912th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. My name is Tom McDonough. This is my first time up here, and I have to tell you, it's very, very intimidating with these gentlemen staring at me here. So, um, you cut me some slack. The gentlemen and then there's Mario. But, but uh, again, please, uh, you're welcome. And I'm really excited about my first official meeting today. And uh, I think both Glenn and Rich were pretty surprised to see me um, here. So it's all great. So our, we have an action-packed uh, business meeting followed by presentations by Julie Kaufman, who was patient, patiently waited uh, through last month's or July's meeting and didn't get her chance. So we're, we're, she's going to get 15 minutes today. And then Rich, Laura, and Glenn are going to describe um, some of the work they've been doing on trying to revitalize our um, star party efforts. And, uh, we had a great meeting a couple weeks ago, and they're going to speak to the product of that. So I'm really excited about that. While you're doing that, I'll get the refreshments ready. And uh, with that, we'll go to the next slide. So we have. So today, we, uh, John Harrington is still in Montana, I believe. So he's been doing some astronomy-based work, and we don't have a great report from him today. But if you refer to the to the uh, newsletter, which Al did a great job in getting that out this month, you can see exactly what happened in the last meeting. So we'll just move on from there. So we're gonna, um, we do have it. Bruce is here for the observing committee. Glenn is here. Glenn is here. Great. Good to be back, so I have to look at these people in the front row. Okay, go ahead and dance it. Uh, I was checking for, there weren't a lot of naked eye specials outside of the moon being their planets, things like that, but I guess one of the big uh, items right now is Comet giacobini Zinner. It's a periodic comet, I think the period is something like six years, if I recall. I know very little about it because I haven't seen a thing for the last two months. It's been cloudy every night, but Joe in the back was just talking to me about it earlier. If you want to let everybody get them up to date on what's going on with that comet. I, I observed it over Labor Day weekend, uh, the 10 inch scope uh, at the Cape. So it was, the skies were dark. It was actually right by, just as it went by Capella. So two nights in a row, yeah. just look at Capella, look off to the right, and it was very easy to find. Not, not that spectacular. You can see a nice combo. A little bit of a tail if you imagine it. But, uh, <laughs> couldn't see it in the dark, it was very well. Uh, but in the 10 inch, it was, it was pretty easy. And where were you observing from? Uh, up uh, the tip of the cape. So just before front of the So pretty dark. Yeah. And photo op opportunity right here. I believe that's around the 5th. It's going to go right through M35. So any of you that do ask the photographer, that'd be a good time to check it out. I'd love to know what that double star was in the picture right there. It looks like uh, probably Almac in uh, Andromeda, it's hard to say. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, by the way, Ed, it was doing the Sioux French uh, challenge, the Sioux French uh, object for the month, the fan club, and I got an email from Jim Mullaney, and apparently she's retiring. She's not going to be doing the column much anymore, so I don't know who's taking it over. They guess it was they were looking for somebody, so Mario, it's open for you if you want to do it. <laughs> well, the thing is around here, if you live in New England, if you look at the, the extent of the objects that she covered in her column, there were quite a few. You'd have to have a really dark sky area to give that column any justice, and I just don't see anything in this immediate area anyway. So probably the replacement person will be from Arizona, someplace like that. Anyway, the observance challenge is NGC 6818. It's a little planetary nebula up in the upper corner of Sagittarius, and uh, it's called a Little Blue Gem. And it's a, it's a rather interesting planetary nebula. I've seen it with a three-inch scope, so it's not impossible to see. But of course, if you want to see any detail, you've got to go with a larger scope. And there's a secondary challenge, and that's the object just below it. That's Barnard's Galaxy, which is ninth magnitude, but it covers an area about half the size of the full moon, so it's extremely faint. Have you ever seen your nodding head there? Have you ever seen it, Steve? Yeah. 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 From the clubhouse? No. New Hampshire. No, not the not clubhouse. <laughs> so it's another, you definitely have to have a dark sky for yeah. that. Okay, I think that's it. Anybody have any comments or additions as far as observing? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Go ahead. So I put together oh. a little slide today. So Glenn and I were talking about, yes. uh, about uh, 
Well, so James, James, good luck. <laughs> Watch those people in the front row. <laughs> we were talking about uh, visual variable star observing, <laughs> and so I thought this would be a great opportunity to pick out one of the easiest ones in the sky. And we're talking about Algol, which is the Gruul star. I think it's Algol. Uh, and uh, it is a, a, a eclipsing binary. So um, a very, very nice. And you can see here, if people are not familiar with that, you have, in this system, you actually have, it's a tri trinary star system. But the main players are um, K2 and V8. And these stars, uh, uh, one is rotating around the other, or they rotate around a common point, I should say. And uh, when the smaller, dimmer star moves in front of the brighter star, you get a dip in, in the magnitude. And um, you also see that when the, the dimmer star uh, moves in back of the, uh, the, the, dark, the more bright star. So it's uh, very convenient. You, know, you can easily see it uh, in uh, the constellation um, Perseus. Uh, very easy to pull out. And um, you know, here I went onto the Sky and Telescope website. You know, I, I looked on uh, astronomy. I couldn't find anything where we could calculate the minima for Algol. But uh, clearly on uh, September 22nd, that's not great. But we, we've got uh, 6.30 AM, so a little late. But at 3.21 on the 25th, at, uh, uh, on the 28th, and potentially the 30th, we should be able to detect the minima. And you can actually go out and record them based on, on the comparison stars and actually draw your own curves from this. So it's a lot of fun to do. It's about two hours, I think, yeah, from I jump in maxima that, to minimum, right. and so you should be able to do that pretty readily at these times. Huh? Mm -hmm. Is that universal time or Eastern? This actually is Eastern time here, but on the website you can calculate it for universal also. Okay. Um, it just happened, I didn't do it for this month, but we did do a session uh, a couple of years ago on Algol, and the actual eclipse from about here, it's about 3.2 magnitude to right about here. That's about eight hours, but the real action is about the middle five or six hours, and that's what we concentrated on. And what we want to do is find a night when uh, the, the faintest point is about maybe four hours after sunset. So I think we're going to pick probably something in October, November. That Perseus is a good, convenient place in the sky so you can see it. But a bunch of us, about six of us tried it out, and I'll put together a chart, a comparison chart and it has the different magnitudes of various objects there. It's a fun object, and we looked about every 15 minutes. So if you want to bring a telescope and just look at other things, I just all of a sudden ring the bell or whatever, it's time to observe, and we take a, we note the time, and we put down the magnitude, and at the end of the evening, we actually made light curves, had a group light curve. So I'd like to do that again. It was kind of a fun evening. And uh, I will again, I'll have charts for you, and I'll find out the times too, and I'll put something out on the, on the website. That's great. Okay. Yes, I tried to stump Glenn, but I'm going to have to try a little harder. You know? uh, any questions or comments on it? Uh, on the diagram, mm -hmm. the B star, is it really getting material sucked off of it by the, uh, the hotter one? Presumably that's the case, and uh, that you're actually getting, uh, uh, this is becoming dimmer because it is sucking uh, matter. So. The B star is getting bigger as time goes on. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious how you, other than visually, measure the magnitude. Well, there's, uh, it's so bright; it's t it would be hard to do it in other other manners. You could do it uh, photographically. You could do it, um, you know, photo multipliers with CCD cameras. But they're yeah. so bright. I was just going to say, uh, uh, I'm giving a talk at the. Uh, Astro assembly, bulk variable star observing, but it's basically a naked eye thing. You have the magnitudes of stars in the area, right. and you do a comparison. If it's equal to one of the stars, you put that magnitude down. If it's kind of in between two, you can interpolate. And the human eye is good for about like, three tenths of a magnitude accuracy. And since this star is maybe a little bit more than a magnitude, uh, you can get a pretty decent uh, fix on that, even if you're a beginner. So it's not that bad, but it's basically visual. Mario would know better than me, but I believe for something like CCD work, that star is way too bright. Am I right? The <coughs> second magnitude star is it's really... It's just too bright for CCD. Yeah. So it really is a naked eye object. Just the shutter alone, because of the shutter speed. You, you really can't get a good measurement that way. I mean, for dimmer stars, transits, and all that, 
Yeah, do the CCD measurement, mm -hmm. and you just tap measurement, measure another differential measure, it's easy. But uh, you have to use a really tiny scope to, to do that mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So the clubhouse committee report, I see. I saw Elbow a couple of years ago with Glenn, and you could notice a visual dip after a few hours, one night at the clubhouse, in the fall, in fact. It was very nice, well worth doing. So over the summer, we had a lot of volunteers. It was a very good summer for work parties. Uh, quite a few people showed up. July 28th, there were 34 members and friends. On the 25th of August, 24, which is actually very good for August. And then on Saturday last week, September 1st, we had kind of a mini work party for prep work for the picnic, which is this Saturday, as you probably know, beginning, beginning at 3 o'clock. Uh, there were eight, about 18 people who showed up. And again, we owe a, a really a big thank you to John Blomquist for hauling out his tractor three or four times this summer and mowing the entire property. Uh, it, just, it just really cuts our work down so much when we have him to help us. We've done it ourselves before without John's help when his tractor's been on the fritz or he was laid up, and it, it takes a lot of manpower to do the entire property, quite a bit. Uh, beyond that, we did have people who did some uh, trimming and uh, used the power mowers to do around the observatories in the clubhouse. That went very well. So the grounds look very good right now. We had another crew that was cutting back some limbs and some shrubs uh, and did some clearing as well and raking, so it did, did very well, came out very good. The other big thing that took place in the last couple of work parties was a lot of staining. We uh, successfully stained a good portion of the roll-off observatory, particularly the eastern wall, and all the supporting uh, supports for it, which was a big job. Also, Dave Proughton replaced some rotted lumber on the 17-inch Dobsonian hutch, which we're dedicating to Sai Balaba this weekend at the picnic. So that looks very good. Um, Maria, thank you for all the help with that. It, it's been painted, stained, and we tuned up the telescope. Uh, Rich, I think uh, you would clean the mirror a month or two ago. Yeah. It looks very good. So if you come out Saturday, we'll show it to you. It looks, looks great. Uh, in addition, we did some cleaning in the clubhouse, vacuuming, kind of spiffed the place up for this weekend's picnic. And also, uh, the Aereo Observatory, I think they stained the door, gave that a couple of coats, so that's, that's in pretty good shape, too. On the weekend, Saturday in particular, I'll be giving training for anybody who might be interested in using our new 25-inch Dobsonian. It's really totally up to speed now, so if anybody would like to learn how to use it, I'll put you on the list. And uh, the checkout procedure is pretty simple, and also the 17-inch, too. If you're a little intimidated by the big gun, you can use the medium gun. 17 is a nice telescope. It's a Colte mirror. It's a 17.5 inch f4.5. Uh, it's a thin, a semi-thin mirror. It's about an inch and five eighths inch thick, but it holds a very good figure. We had it coated about three years ago. We've got heat on the mirror all the time, so it's it's just a very very good optical system. I really encourage you to use it. It's Casual Dave, observing. Dave Brown did a nice job of uh, colonating that thing up that we did. The areas were in the rotational position of the secondary, mm -hmm. which was just off enough to throw the colonization off. So it yeah. should be performing pretty well now. That, yes. In fact, we uh, took apart the, the uh, secondary for the 25 inch on Saturday and clean, Phil cleaned it. Phil Roundsville cleaned it. That has a six inch minor axis. That's one big piece of glass. It's a big flat, six by nine inches which today cost over a thousand bucks to replace. So we're very lucky to have that system. So anyway, hope to see you uh, on Saturday, perhaps. If not, the next work party is the following Saturday, September 22nd. Thank you, sir. Okay, telescope making committee report. Um, it didn't get a chance to reach out to anyone about what's going on in the telescope. I know that Mike has been out for a couple of weeks, um, so we'll have to round the wagons and find out what's going on with that. Um, unless anyone has an interim report. Barry Jensen has been up there in Mike's absence. Oh, that's uh, great. The, uh, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he's pretty seems to be pretty knowledgeable on all this. Um, so he, I haven't seen that many people working up there lately, but they're still open for business. So great. Okay, outreach committee. 
Well, why don't we just so, do that when we do the whole? That sounds like a great thing. idea. And do we have any old business? Yes, sir. Well, just for the picnic, I, I still need people to come and help. Um, we're setting up the tents at 10:30, 11. Um, so if you can come and lend a hand, it will go fast. Uh, we need people to help um, set up little tables also, to food tables in the, in the chairs and all that sort of stuff. So the more people who can help, the better. Uh, then cleaning up afterwards, we have to take everything down and put it away <coughs> before it gets dark. Last year, or one year, I think it was two years ago, we had a microburst and it destroyed my, my food tent. So Al had to re, re, remake the, the, the whole tent, put it back together again. It took, it took quite a while. So we want to get everything down the, the, the same day as the picnic. So if you can come, if you see me after the meeting, if you can come and, and lend a hand setting up or breaking <coughs> up. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Anything else? Any new business? Nope. Okay. Oh, I, I may have something. So, um, talking about the clubhouse, uh, our wireless router went down uh, last month. And so Bruce Berger, Jim Geddes, and I, uh, we were up there on, third, on Tuesday night and we got it working. So if you, have a, if you are at the uh, clubhouse and you need Wi-Fi access, uh, talk to me or Bruce uh, Berger and we can get you set up on the uh, wireless router. It is a different password now, okay. um, so that's why you set it up. We can explain it. Okay. Good. <coughs> Any questions, comments, or anything else before we move forward with our main event? Great. Okay. So I'd like to introduce Julie, who's going to uh, speak about her great American eclipse ex uh, well, I experience. I it's about multiple eclipses, All right. not just one. It's an eclipse explanation. It says not Mario. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's doing that. I don't know. You have to be serious about this. Kind of have fun. Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, I'm doing this right now. Somewhere it's putting a setting on the kitchen. If you didn't test this out, we'd spend it. It was fine before, yeah. It was showing you the, uh, what? Uh, okay, mouse on that one. That's a good mistake. Click the swap is late. Okay. Where, where, where do I get the mouse on that? Yes, that's a good question. That's the question. Far left and really far right. I can't, I can't yeah, see the mouse on that. There it is. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. I don't want it on that for me either. New slide shows. Slot this. Okay. 
Oops. So, oh, I see. It went back again. Yeah, right. yeah. And one of us has to have that on there, I yep. guess. And I don't want it. Okay, so um, Al thought that I was going to just be talking about the Great American Eclipse, but I'm talking about the 10 eclipses that I have been to. So um, we will be doing not just the Great American Eclipse. Um, Mario very rightly said that it is an eclipse expedition, but I also felt like, well, it's not just that. So for me, it's not just an eclipse expedition, it's also a vacation and an adventure. And I have the greatest respect, I will say, for anybody that is organizing a trip. It takes an awful lot of work, and I'm also thrilled that somebody else is out there taking photos so that I can just enjoy watching it and I can see the photos later. So it is not in any way disparaging to say that. Um, I'm, I like part of the adventure, not just the eclipse. So a little bit about me. Um, I am not a science person. I study cultural anthropology. I teach dancing. And anytime there's anything related to chocolate, I'm there. <laughs> so um, you will see a few times I was at chocolate plantations and various and sundry chocolate things. My equipment are. 10 by 50 binoculars, which you see here, me and various other people looking through them. This is my other equipment. This is how I get pictures. I go to other people and say, can I have your photos? And everybody is very nice about sharing them. So it started out with CDs, flash drives, and OPs, other people's telescopes. So that's my equipment. And unfortunately, I can't tell you about any of the camera settings, telescope specs, or anything from all the pictures that I had because I don't know what they are. So why do I travel? Obviously, eclipses are in here. And also, I've been to the transit of Venus in Egypt. And I went to uh, Rio and um, other parts of Brazil to see Halley's Comet. So it's definitely important, but it's also the culture, the people, and you start seeing the same people over and over. So I get to see some friends over and over, as well as just interesting people, the landscapes, the various attractions, the flora and fauna, the food and markets, all of these things excite me while I'm traveling. So as Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And also, um, who can ignore the Dalai Lama? So I like to listen to him once a year, go someplace you've never been before. And then this is a sign when I was going to Zimbabwe that was in the airport in London, which I thought was fun. So when I'm traveling, I like to push my boundaries a little bit. So some of the different ways other than your usual way that I have traveled over the years, I've ridden elephants in Africa and in Bali. I've gone horseback riding in Africa, in Bali, in Mongolia, and somewhere else. Um, I did take the, the rapid train in Shanghai. That's the speed it was going, 430 kilometers. Um, I did take a couple of cruise ships. I've been on little airplanes in Mongolia that then we had to go in various kinds of jeeps. Where's the Russian jeep? Here we are. Um, for eight hours to get from where the airport was to where we were watching the eclipse. I've been in little rickshaws and fishing boats and camels. So I try and try something new each time I'm going someplace. I also, as I said, I'm dancing a lot. So any place I go, I try and find some place where I can see the local dancing. And sometimes it's just dancing in the street as it was in China. Sometimes it's performances as in Bali here. These are the whirling dervishes in Turkey. These are some of the dancers in the Cook Islands. These are some kids who are just dancing in um, Zimbabwe. So anytime there's any kind of dancing, I will go and see some. Also, get to see some famous people. So some of these you know. Um, we all know Bob there. This is the editor of Sky and Telescope in Australia. 
Um, this is, what's, Peter, what's his name? Make sure I get it correctly. Um, the people who did the Great American Eclipse website, um, Michael Zeller and Polly White here. We know Steve, who uh, is from Skyscrapers, and his wife, he was on the cruise with me in Indonesia. Um, David Levy and Wendy um, met, ran into them. I had met them before on the cruise in Aruba. Buzz Aldrin was on uh, my cruise. Um, Fred Espinak was the same place that I was in um, Indonesia. And this, um, this guy uh, does, what is it called exactly? The Eclipse Nuts. He does a lot of cartoons about eclipses. So while you're traveling, you get to meet lots of interesting people. So a little bit about eclipse mythology. There's a whole bunch of different stories where the sun is being eaten or stolen. Um, this is from Bali and also from um, India, where a demon steals the elixir of immortality and um, the gods cut off his head. And his head is immortal, but his body isn't. So when he swallows the sun, it falls out the other side. And that's how eclipses don't happen. Norse mythology, you have the wolves that swallow the sun. There's a dragon that steals the sun from China. There are various stories of the sun and the moon either being brother and sister and they have incest or somewhere there's a rape. This is from Dahomey, the, the, the sun goddess and the moon god and they are just making love and some people who say it's this lovely little thing where they're kissing. Lots of different stories of how you get rid of an eclipse. Um, Indians and various other tribes where you shoot flaming arrows into the sky. The Aztecs believed that you had to have blood sacrifice or else the world would end. So they would cut out somebody's heart. Lovely little things. But here's the truth. So what do we know eclipses don't happen from? They don't cause disaster and destruction. Some people are told you can't breathe the air outside. We know that's fake news. Food cooked during an eclipse is poison. These are all stories that people have, and we know that these are not true. Warning to mankind about our sins. Maybe. In Italy, they say that flowers planted during an eclipse will be brighter. We don't know that that happens. It's dangerous for pregnant women to be out. <laughs> and the end of the world. Well, according to these people, it's already tomorrow in Australia, so it can't be the end of the world. So what is the real reason? Oh, here's the answer. <laughs> can, you, can you see it? <laughs> it's what really happens is it's a photo bomb for those people who can't read it. So this is a map of my first three places. Um, and I'm going to go over each of them and then these are the next seven plus Chile, which I put a deposit on. So hopefully by next summer, I'll have another one to add to it. So my first one was November 3rd, 1994 in Peru. And Peru for many people is a bucket list place to go to Machu Picchu, see Andes Mountains, the Inca ruins. I don't have a lot of photos from this, but just to give you a feel for the people, very colorful, lots of wonderful markets. Lots of llama, lots of um, <coughs> vicuna as well. Great Great markets. You had to be in Bolivia, right? What? You had to be in Bolivia for that. No, no, we were we were in southern Peru in '94 because we were there. <laughs> um, this is Machu Picchu. For those people who haven't seen pictures, this is the road that goes up it that you take a uh, a bus on and hope that it doesn't fall over the edge. And then there are ways to climb up the various mountains and look down on it. You can also climb this one if you are so inclined. I was not. Um, but just an incredible place to go. And then southern Peru where we went, there's the Andes Mountains. Um, this is a um, volcano called Misti in Arequipa. Um, this is a nunnery and cathedrals and various surgery churches and unfortunately I don't have any pictures of the eclipse. It was slightly high clouds over it but we could see the whole thing clearly. 
my second eclipse. This was happening the day before my 50th birthday, and I said, well, I have to go. I mean, it's, that's just have to happen. Um, a dear friend went with me um, on the way. We went to the rainforest in Dominica, went to a chocolate plantation in Granada, went to a Venetian glass blowing in um, Venezuela. So this is some of Dominica. This is chocolate pods, if you've never seen them before. That's how they grow. Volcanoes, waterfalls, this is all from Dominica. And then I try to, whenever possible, get some of the setup that was happening. This was on a cruise ship. So we were lined up along both sides, along with the crazy people who were in the pool saying, what's going on out there? Why are they, you know, why is it getting dark? I want to get my son to bed. Um, I had no idea what was going on. But this was the, the setup. And these were some pictures that I got. That one I actually took with my camera, and you can see a couple of ones, but I don't remember which ones. And this was taken by the cruise ship. And I had to scan them, and I have a, my good printer isn't working, so I, it's a lousy scan of a lovely picture of the diamond ring. Then, August 1999 in Europe, I decided that I just had to go. And so this is a map showing you all of the possibilities. And if you can't see it really well, it's like 70%, 30%, 30%, 40%, 60%. It was not great chances throughout there. But I just said, oh, well, I'll go and see how far east I can get. So I started out um, in London and visited my niece and a college friend. Then I went to Alsace-Lorraine, where my um, mother's father's family was from, and said, OK, I'll see what I can find. And then afterwards, I went to Heidelberg, where it was my father's family, and ended up visiting friends from Holland. So I had lots of wonderful connections to do around the eclipse. When you get into Strasbourg, there's this wonderful astronomical clock that I spent a couple of hours just staring at and watching everything that was going on. It has all of the, um, the apostles passing before Christ at 12 o'clock, but then it has all sorts of other astronomical things going on up here and down over here. It's a wonderful thing to see. So I got into um, Strasbourg and said, well, I have no idea where I'm going, and I found this brochure. And you can't really read it and don't expect that you would, but every town had, well, we're having this going on and that going on and this going on and that going on. And lots of them sounded really interesting. And then I found this one in a town called Marmoutier that had country western dancing and an American Indian presentation. And I said, well, that sounds like a good place to go. So I ended up there in the town with no reservations and very little French and managed to get a, um, a room at the last minute, even though there was nothing available, and um, spent the night there. While I was in um, Strasbourg, I went to the um, planetarium, and they had a special show about um, the sun and various things going on, as well as about the eclipse. And then the little church in Marmoutier had um, something about the eclipse, but also something about the root of Judaism. So it was like a wonderful extra bonus to get to that. So I just have a quick reading. I wrote this, I don't even want to put all the words up, um, to all my friends about the eclipse. And I'm just going to highlight it very quickly, because we were, I was in this little town. Weather prospects all over Europe were not looking too good. But I decided that we would get a chance anyway. So 9 a.m. breakfast, there's a light rain, but the weather has been cloudy almost every morning and then clearing up later. 10.30 a.m., clouds are breaking up and the sky is clearing. The eclipse site is a couple of kilometers north of the grounds of a chapel. As I walk up there, the sky is clear blue, but clouds are forming on the horizon. 11.11 11 a.m., first contact. We can see it through the clouds. From 11.12 to 11.50 a.m., storm clouds start gathering again. At 11.50 a.m., the rain starts. 11.58, torrential downpour. Everybody runs for cover, either under the umbrella of the beer garden or into the chapel. Rain continues until 12.20 p.m. 12.21 p.m., the clouds begin to take some shapes, and there's a few thin, cloudy holes that appear between the thick clouds. 12.27, almost totally eclipsed sun peeks through one hole. Another cloud covers it up. 12.28, another hole is moving in the right direction. 
12.29 p.m., the second hole slips across the sun. There's only one minute to go. 12.30, we can see totality. Through the clouds, able to see the diamond ring, but we can see the corona appears, but can't extend very far because the cloud hole is so small. Venus also shines brightly through the clouds. 12.33 p.m., so that was 12.30 that we saw totality. 12.33 p.m., as the second diamond ring appears, a dark cloud again covers the sun and we cannot even see it. 12.34 to 1.45, periodic glimpses of the partial phases. We were the only town in that entire area that got to see it. Everybody else was um, totally clouded out. So again, luck was with me on that one. So afterwards, I went to Heidelberg, which is a lovely town, but it's also the town where my father's family came from. Um, Otto is my father's father, Theodore is my father, and this is the house that the family actually lived in. I was able to find it based on the address on this little family tree that we had. So it was a lovely trip to add, as well as seeing the eclipse, I got to visit some family. Next one I went to, 2001 in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Went on African safari, which, how can you not enjoy that? Did walking and driving safaris, did two days of canoeing on the Zambezi River, met Chiwari, who you will see in a moment, and then took a helicopter ride over Victoria Falls. So again, a wonderful adventure. This is Chiwari. Chiwari is a black rhino that was brought up by rangers because her mother had been shot. Um, anytime anybody comes in a Land Rover, a Land Rover to her meant food, that was family. So she'd come charging over, and if you didn't know that she was friendly, and we were actually able to get out and pet her until another car came, and then our guide said, no, get in the car, we don't want anybody else to know. So um, we did get a chance to get very close up with an um, endangered black rhino. And this is us canoeing down the Zambezi, where we got to see a lot of elephants, a lot of hippos. At one point, we got yelled at by our, by our guide to back paddle, back paddle for your lives, because the male hippo had just come up out of the water. And he was very angry that we were disturbing him and getting near his females. Um, <laughs> so lots of hippo, lots of zebra. Here's where I was horseback riding. That's literally, that's not close up. The, the, the um, Cape Buffalo were about the distance that the back of the room is here from us. But when you're on horseback, you're, they don't smell you as a human. They, they see it as a four-legged animal, so you're not a threat to them, so you can get really close to other wildlife. And these are what are called fast food for lions. Mm. <laughs> and just a little bit of the views. A baobab tree, this is a bridge near Victoria Falls. Some of the kids, this was one of our guides. They always walk with rifles. Um, some lovely sunsets that you get in lots of places over the river. And then this was our site for the eclipse, and this was a, one of the people on there gave me the, the photos. Totally clear skies, a, be a beautiful eclipse again. The next one, March 29th, 2016, um, decided that Turkey sounded better than going to, I had already been to Egypt for um, transit of Venus in between, so I didn't want to go back to Egypt for the eclipse, so I decided to go to Turkey instead. I took a trip on my own beforehand to Cappadocia, if you've never been there. It's a fabulous place. It's all of these caves that are carved into the landscape, and people after people after people would escape into them when some other new group of people came and attacked and there's temples in there and there's drawings on the walls and it's all carved into the into the walls themselves and it's just a fascinating place to, to go and this is the front of my hotel actually i uh, got to stay in in a cave hotel and so all the rooms are literally carved into the caves in istanbul you have um the Hagia sophia you have the blue mosque you have the Tapkapi Palace, you have um, wonderful markets, great houses that look like they could be on the San Francisco Hill. There's your internet cafe, so if you ever need internet, there's always a place to go for it. And um, that's Pamukkale, it's a, make sure I get 
correct what it is. Um, limestone hot springs called Cotton Castle. Um, this was looking out our window, lots of taxis, but then another day they were having some riots, so this is all the riot police. Um, yeah, so Turkey can be, can be challenging, but it is also a beautiful place to go to, wonderful food in the markets and beautiful poppies that I don't know whether they're the um, opium poppies or not, but they're very pretty to look at. And just the faces of people always interest me. This was a woman we met who was making bread and she and four friends invited us over to come and sit with them. We couldn't speak a word to each other, but we managed to have a wonderful conversation about their life and our life based on offering us of things and we offered them things and just a chance meeting. This was a guy in the market selling coffee. This is silkworms. This is a gentleman playing music for the uh, whirling dervishes that we went to the dance performance. Um, various and sundry faces of, of the people of Turkey. Also a lot of Roman ruins. This was a library. This was the bathroom and it was deliberately made that way. Every morning people would go and sit together and have conversations and decide the business of the day while they were doing their business. <laughs> um, so lots of wonderful Roman ruins all throughout Turkey. And we went to the southern coast and um, were right by the, the water. It was Mediterranean at that point, I believe. Um, and this is just some of the different setups of people. There was another group from Canada up on this little hill behind us. And, uh, and that was the eclipse in Turkey. And I do believe that was photoshopped. We were not right. We were not right by the way. And again, but I didn't do it. <coughs> then Mongolia, because my master's degree was about nomadic people, so why not go to Mongolia? Um, and I also like going to the desert. So I went to the, the Gobi Desert and Genghis Khan Palace, and then we went that that's mostly in the south and, and the east in Mongolia. We went to the far west to see the eclipse, and as I said, it was a two plane rides and then eight hours on dirt roads or what might have been roads um, to get to our eclipse site. So everything here but one are things that they heard in one way or another. Um, there's camels, there's yaks, there's horses. You've mostly heard about the falcons that, that people have in Mongolia. Um, sheep, goats, and these are the wild horses of Mongolia, and the name is something I can't pronounce, it's some Polish name, and they have two extra chromosomes. So they are kept totally separate from the rest of the horses and made sure that, that they can keep the breed alive. But all of these others are herded by the nomads. Um, and what more could you need? After all, you had somebody with a, doing you a wood-burning stove, homemade cheese, you had your TV, your grocery store, your hotel, and your Irish pub. I mean, what, more, what more could anybody ask for on a trip, right? And just some of the, the faces of the people. When you start out, they're much more um, related to the Chinese. When you're in Eastern Mongolia and Western Mongolia, you get more um, mix of, of different Asian things and also some blondes as you can see here, and, and there's whole long stories about the crossing of people from Hungary and that area into um, parts of Mongolia. These girls are, this is in the, the hills where the dinosaurs were found. I brought little sticker um, things of dinosaurs to give out to the kids, and so they were showing those off. Um, this is um, Ulaanbaatar, and that's the suburbs, if you turn around and face the other way. And already in the suburbs, you have people living in their cares or their, their tents. Um, in the middle there, that's the, the flaming cliffs where Roy Chapman Andrews found um, the dinosaur remains. There are a whole bunch of remains in through here, so it's been a while. These don't look like they're very big, but it's this huge sand dunes that are right in the middle of the country that have to do with the mountains in, in Russia coming over and bringing the sand from, from somewhere else. And so you have this sand dune in the middle of nowhere 
This was a glacier that we went to visit one day. This was a typical bridge across any river that we had to go to. In order to get to this waterfall, we had to go down this path here. So a little bit of an adventure. They're also Buddhists, so lots of temples. These are on the road everywhere, and you're supposed to ride counterclockwise around them twice, or else if you can't do every one because it would take eight hours to go three miles because there's so many of them, you have to beep your horn twice to because that's where somebody who was holy is buried. Um, but all sorts of different temples. This is just from somebody's house. They have shrines in their own house. This is a golden Buddha in one of the temples. Up in the hills you have temples, so they're all over the place. There's wonderful temples. So this was <coughs> moonrise, moonset, sorry, because um, it was the sunrise in those sand dunes that I mentioned before. These are called the singing dunes because when you stand on the sand and you go down them, it makes this wonderful singing noise. Um, and then just some other sunsets and sunrises and moons and Delta of Venus along our travels in, in the Gobi, which is, Gobi means desert, so it's not really the Gobi Desert, it's the Gobi. So a bunch of different rainbows at various times and crepuscular rays. There was lots of things to look at while you're on the way to the site. So this was the site where we were for the eclipse. And this was later on in the afternoon. The eclipse wasn't until late afternoon. And our guides had said, you have to go climb up this hill. And we said, OK. Well, while I was standing about where these guys are here, some of the people already started to walk. And you can see them there those two tiny little dots. Those are two people who are on their way up the hill. When you get to the top of the hill, that's our campsite. This is Russia, that's Kazakhstan, and right over here is China. So we were way over the end of Mongolia. So we were, we were camping because that's the only thing that you can do in the area. And when you get to the top of the hill, this is what you find. There are all sorts of, of rock carvings, and they still don't know for sure who did them or how old they are. But it was definitely well worth the climb. So here's this various and sundry setups of people um, for the eclipse. It was very windy, so we set up this windbreak. This is a guy called Big Dave, whose last name I don't know. It was his first eclipse. He just set up his camera and had a hand clicker and clicked the whole time and took pictures and was good enough to share them with me. So these are the photos courtesy of Big Dave. That was our one cloud. Tell me if I should go slower. So then we had, next place was in China. And um, as we know, China is a little bit different from the rest of us. Um, not only Beijing and Shanghai and the Terracotta Warriors, but we also got to go up to Yunnan, which is where our guide was from. So we got to stay with families and stuff. And then I went to Guilin, which is that place that you see on all the calendars with the mountains and you think it can't be real. It is. The Occident Bar is from Yunnan because it's up right near the border with Tibet. And sometimes you might need it. So again, the faces, just wonderful things to look at. We went backstage to the theater beforehand and got to watch them as they were putting on their makeup. Just daily life, people reading, people making things, the market. This is up in, in Yunnan, so they, they are slightly more related to Tibetans and some of the other tribes. This is just some of the food from the markets, a little bit different from what we're used to, but always beautifully displayed. Just a quick terracotta warriors, uh, the Great Wall of China, we got to walk on it. It was a bit cloudy that day. This is the Olympic Stadium. This is one of the royal palaces. This is just a little side street in, in Beijing. We did get to spend a few hours at the Beijing Ancient Observatory and see some of these wonderful old astronomical equipment that somebody else could explain better than me, I'm sure. A few more of the people just because 
they are so different, such wonderful, interesting faces. And this was our setup. Unfortunately, we were at this hotel and decided that it wouldn't make any difference if we moved. Got to see the partial. This is from the newspaper. But as we know, this is what happened. And unfortunately, we were in one of those areas that got clouded out. I know the group from Atmod was able to see the eclipse. And some of the people who got stuck on the bridge got to see it. But a lot of people got clouded out. And as we know, this happens a lot. But afterwards, I got to go to Guilin, which is these fabulous rock formations and mountains. And you, you, it looks lovely, but when, when you really see it, there are these boats probably leaving every five minutes going down the river. So there's piles and piles and piles of boats. But absolutely fabulous place to see. If you ever get a chance, you should go there. So then. July 11, 2010. Easter Island was too expensive for me, so I decided to go to the Cook Islands, which I will show you where it is in a minute. Um, just a wonderful tropical paradise with whatever as kind of the attitude. So this is the Cook Islands. If you go from Los Angeles to Hawaii, Cook Islands are just a little bit further south. It's in the same time zone. Um, people from New Zealand use the Cook Islands the way we do the Caribbean. So you see a lot of people from New Zealand there. There are the southern group of islands which are inhabited and the northern ones which are not. The main island is Rarotonga. Aitutaki is the one that was used in Survivor. And if you ever do any kind of snorkeling or diving, that's where you go. And Mangaya, which is the island where we went for the eclipse. So just like Mongolia, we had all the comforts of home. We had a donut shop. We had an ATM, and there's the um, internet cafe, there's the bar, there's Spaniel Hall, there's your 7-Eleven, there's your farmer's market, there's the supermarket, and free beer. I mean, what else could you ask for? Just everything you could want. And just again, some of the people, and as I said with the chocolate, I was riding my electric bike around the island and saw the sign and said, oh, I have to stop. And I met these two lovely women that I probably spent seven or eight days with over the course of the two and a half weeks I was there and just great hostesses and they drove me places and took me to the airport and were just delightful people. Um, this guy, somebody might, you may have seen him. They had a picture of him in the Boston Globe about six months ago. He just retired. He does tours of all the medicinal pro um, properties of plants that are in the area. These are Sunday church that they all dress in white and the singing is just very, very different kind of thing. And if I had more time, I would have done videos with these, but didn't have time. So three islands. Rarotonga is got, um, volcano in the middle and jungles around the edge and beaches everywhere else and lots of little islands here so wonderful beaches all the way around the island and you can drive all the way around. Aichitake went for a couple of days just to do some snorkeling, some lovely sunsets, lots of, of things to see under underwater just got a few pictures from other people. And then Mangaya, which is the oldest island in, in the Pacific. It's um, volcanic fossil coral caves. The, the people there, until they chose to be converted, were um, cannibals. And there are places in these caves where, and here, these are some human bones. And in the cave, there are some human remains. And basically what happened is they would have a fight and somebody would run up into the caves and live in the caves for six months to a year until they forgot what the fight was about and come back down again. And these are the fields that they cultivated and then everything was fine for a while and then they had some fights and somebody else would run up into the caves and live in the caves for a while. Um, they decided to convert when um, the missionaries came, they kicked them out and said, go away, we're not interested. But then they found that the medicine worked better for some illnesses that they had. And so they said, oh, well, their magic is stronger than ours. We're going to force everybody to convert to Christianity. So they abandoned their old religion and converted to Christianity. 
from Rarotonga is where the original people went and um, populated New Zealand. So the Maori are descended from the people of the Cook Islands. So this was our day we went to the airport. The um, Sky and Telescope group was also there. You can see here just a little sliver of the sun. This was the day before. This is the mayor of the island. But unfortunately, the clouds came in and we didn't get to see the eclipse from there. I was told that if you went further along the island, some places you could, but again, we didn't get to see it. So then the next trip I went on, 2016, to Indonesia. I spent a week in Bali before I went on the um, cruise ship because you could only be on very small islands that were very expensive or on a cruise ship. So this was, again, the entrance to my hotel. The first day I got there, I thought that was a, a nice thing. Um, Bali is um, Hindu, so you have lots of temples and lots of gods and goddesses, temples up on hills and temples by the water. Uh, this one, you can only reach in low tide. The tide comes up and the temple is kind of floating in the water. Um, so lots of wonderful mythology. I spent my birthday there, um, took an elephant ride, then went to a chocolate factory, um, then ended up having a chocolate milk cake, <coughs> but my guide uh, here, who my sister had used, took me to a place that's mostly for native peoples and you get purified and you get to go into the water here and your guide watches until it was clear enough and then you move on to the next one. So I got totally purified before my, my um, birthday. So it was a, a great way to spend my birthday. And then a couple of different sunrises and sunsets and for a day went to a place with three suns and a few more of them throughout our trip. And this is just some of the, the food. This was my cooking class that I took and some of the markets in Bali and some of them in Indonesia. You can't read it, but this was the ice cream man. We had a thing here with the ice cream. Um, we went to um, Komodo Island, so we got to see the Komodo dragons. This is a, an active volcano on um, the main island in Indonesia. Some flora and fauna again. And here's the cruise ship, our setup for the eclipse itself. Our captain went, I think he said, 30 some odd nautical miles away from where he planned to be in order to get out from under the clouds, which was very nice of him. And again, this gentleman, Dr. Andrew McCray from, I believe, Northern Ireland, was good enough to share his photos with me. And then finally, the Great American Eclipse. This was a trip for me with family and friends. I went and visited with my oldest childhood friend. My sister joined me, and a bunch of people from Atmod also joined me, and my roommate who was I met in Zimbabwe. She was my roommate there. She was my roommate in Turkey, and she came to join us for this. She lives up in um, Sherbrooke, Quebec. So this is what they were publicizing at the time, that the weather wasn't going to cooperate, then they would just change the date. Um, we were out in Eastern Oregon in a place called the Painted Hills and the John Day Fossil Beds. So this is what the Painted Hills look like, just a gorgeous place to be. Um, we went and then this is another part of the John Day Fossil Beds, it's a, these are green instead of the, the reds and oranges. This is an obsidian mountain that up here is um, Bill Robinson. You know, See in a minute. This was the gas station, Space Age. I thought that was fairly appropriate. This was the house we were staying in, and this is somebody. Dave, Dave were these your pictures, or were these Hugos? That must be Hugos. They must be Hugos. Um, this was from the museum. This was our the place we saw the eclipse was right about up there. We were on some private property that we got permission to stay at, and we were staying at a house in Bend. 
And here are some of the people that I was with, and most of them you know. There's Hugo and his wife and his son, and that's Barbara. That's her nephew who joined us, Dave. There's Hugo's daughter. Um, Barbara was with us. This is my, my friend from Zimbabwe. Bill Robinson joined us. So it was a nice hat mob household. This, this was your picture, Dave. Yes. That was the night before? No, that was, that was a couple of days after. A couple of days after. Drives. OK. Um, this was the sunset a few days later when I was mm -hmm. at the shore. If you can see here, that's the, the morning before the eclipse. So that's the new moon the day before the eclipse. Hugo was up like at 5 o'clock in the morning trying to get a picture of it. So it's there. And this was our quote unquote campsite. We, we had a, uh, a camper and we stayed in our cars and this was our setup. We walked up the hill slightly from where the cars were and set up on this hill to watch the eclipse itself. And there's Barbara with her fancy camera and Hugo with his binoculars. And we had lots of fun things to do during the partial and can watch Hugo's movie there. And this was Hugo's pictures. This is something my sister put together. You can see the uh, sun here. Between her fingers there, pieces of the partial. And you saw lots of pictures of this eclipse, so I don't have I don't have a series for you. But Wrapping up, this is some of the fun things that we do during partial phases. That was from Mongolia. This was in Oregon. My sister put the glasses down on her shadow. That was from Indonesia. These were uh, Hugo's kids. That was from Turkey. That was, uh, again, in Oregon. Fun things that you can collect. These are stamps from various places and stickers. And this was um, a submission that I did for skyscrapers for their uh, Astro Bake Off. <coughs> and then one more thing, um, kind of a life lesson tale that kind of sums up two versions of the eclipse. So the long, here's this story for you. The, long, the Lone Ranger and Tonto were camping in the wilderness. After they got their tent set up, both men fell sound asleep. Some hours later, Tonto wakes the Lone Ranger and says, Kimosabe, look towards the sky. What do you see? The Lone Ranger replies, I see millions of stars. What that tell you, said Tonto. The Lone Ranger ponders for a minute, then says, astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Time-wise, it appears to be approximately a quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, the Lord is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it seems we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Tonto? You dumber than buffalo. It means someone stole tent. <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots of different ways that we can look at how we travel and, and what we're looking for in the world. So this is one of the, the guy that I said the, um, that does the Eclipse comics. Um, it's not the same experience. It is. And the how cool it sounds like the supermoon versus how cool something really is, I thought that was a, a good comparison. That's an XKCD cartoon. Yes. But finally, this is what I would say to all of you. You are not too old, and it is not too late. And then, just because we can, Steve Hubbard, this was also from Indonesia. One more set of photos of an eclipse. And that'd be it. Yeah, yeah, much better. <laughs>
place. Okay. I'd be happy to answer questions now or later. Yeah, like given that we're more. running a little long. Yes, I it ran a little long. Already we can just hold off the questions okay. and people can reach out to Julie. I'll get out of your way. Hmm? Yes. I only have two hands. <laughs> And uh, without further ado, hopefully we'll get there. Great. We're going to have a discussion on the uh, Atmod Outreach and Start Party process. So Rich, Laura, and Glenn have been working on this. start from right over here. Because uh, Glenn is going to do the first part of it, um, we just wanted to give you a sort of a brief overview of uh, what we, we do uh, when it comes to star parties and outreach in general. And so um, it was nice enough to put together a PowerPoint on star party uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, and then we have some information about some of the other potential outreach uh, things we could do as a club. So I'm going to turn it right over to Glenn. And, uh, he's not seen the presentation yet, so good. <laughs> Parts of it, right? It's just like you left it. Oh, you're very old. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you want to use this? Or? I prefer to use it. Oh, i never used one of these. I can. Where are your microphones for? Oh, there it is. I've never used one of these. This is new. Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah. It's the wrong direction. Can you hear me now? Hey, point it upward. For me, it doesn't matter. You guys can hear me, right? You might, does it bother you if it's upside down? Okay, the world's still doing its accents. Okay, let's go ahead and get the slides now. All right, we'll go to the next one. Uh, complete Idiot's Guide to Hosting Star Parties. Next slide. An at Mob production. Oh, you changed the uh, font, right? It's very different. I can't read it. It's too small. <laughs> oh, okay. A star party is an outreach event that offers the general public a chance to explore the wonders of the night sky. It may be held on the city sidewalk, on the grounds of a public school, or scout camp, or even your own backyard. By the way, is anybody here from Popscope? Didn't get anybody this time. Okay, we'll talk about Popscope a little later. Okay, next. Uh, just to plan a star party. This is assuming it's already been set up for us, and they'll, we'll talk about that as far as how the star parties are set up or organized for us, but if it's already in place, you want to know your audience. What's the size of the audience? The age or knowledge level of those particular people. Uh, you might try for one telescope for each dozen attendees. Now, I've done star parties for as many as 100 kids. It's kind of crazy, but in those particular groups, the teachers had one group inside, and they had activities for them, and I worked with the other group. Also, I invited some parents to show by, so it did break up the crowds. But really, you probably want to work with about 10 to 12 people uh, at a maximum. Let the organizers remind the attendees to tease beforehand uh, to bring bug spray if it's in the summertime, dress warmly in the winter. Attendees should also be encouraged to bring binoculars and a red filtered flashlight. And you want to prepare some type of observing schedule. What exactly are you going to do on that particular evening? And of course you want to assemble your gear, telescopes, eyepieces, whatever you need. Next. So you're going to bring a telescope and accessories, which include eyepieces, an observing list, a step stool. I always forget the, the step stool. And you have third graders, and you get 100 third graders, and each one I got to lift up the telescope, and I kick myself for not bringing the, st the step stool. <laughs> On the plus side, I always knew the kid could see something, because if I had the moon, for instance, in the, in the field of view, they'd be, I'd be holding them like this, this limp little sack of 30, 30 pounds of kid, all of a sudden, it's like an electrical jolt. They go like that, they kick the crap out of my legs, and they go, wow, because they finally saw the moon. Step stool's a lot nicer on the knees. You might want to have a laser pointer, handouts at the end of the session especially, and of course, you've got to bring enthusiasm. Next. Uh, beginning. 
If possible, open with a brief orientation. Now, that isn't always possible, but I try whenever, especially if it's a school, if there's a little indoor place we can meet beforehand. And one thing I like to do is just do a quick demonstration how to look for a telescope a lot, especially for younger kids, but even adults. They don't know where to look. Some will go up to the eyepiece and start looking, or the uh, finder scope, and start looking for the finder scope. Uh, typically, the kid will grab the eyepiece and go like that, and the whole telescope gets knocked off focus. So I tell them how to just be hands on knees and just put one eye cautiously up the telescope. So it's very simple, but just a thing, a little demonstration how to look through a telescope. I um, do a rundown on proper behavior. If any of you have done a, a star party for third graders, they're all over the map. The little kids go crazy. So it's nice to have the teachers kind of be in control, but it doesn't always work. And I just tell them you could get hurt running around. You could also damage somebody's telescope. So just be patient, stand in the line, and usually we try to show them things to keep them busy at the time that the, the star party is going on. So even if they're not looking through the telescope, they can be seeing things in the night sky with naked eye. Uh, and then we have a preview of tonight's the evening's targeted object. So before we go outside, I'll give them a little prep on what we're going to see. You might want to forewarn attendees not to expect Hubble quality views. This is one thing that's always a problem. I've heard little kids say, boy, that's small. We look at Jupiter, and a lot of people expect that Hubble image. So we have to remind them these things are like Jupiter is about, what, 500 million miles away or so. So it's going to look pretty small, even though it's a big planet. So you kind of give them some type of a preparation of what to expect. And even some of the older groups, like I've had high school kids, they've seen pictures of the Orion Nebula, but it's a Hubble image with all those glorious colors, and it's a little bit of a letdown to see these shades of gray. So you kind of just made me remind them not to have high expectations, but what they're going to see is pretty neat. Next. Anatomy of a star party. Uh, I like to start with a survey of the bright stars and constellations, just an orientation of what's up there that they can recognize. Uh, for children and novice adults, I'll do a telescopic view of the moon and bright plants. Start off with something basic. And usually you don't have to go that much farther than that, especially third graders, because you know, honestly, they don't know what a galaxy is. You know, I've shown galaxies to third graders, and they think somebody breathed on the eyepiece. <laughs> high school, it's different. They have an idea what's going on. Again, with a high school student, if you show them a galaxy, just remind them it's not going to be Hubble quality type of image. Uh, for intermediate groups, then you can include some bright deep sky objects. Double stars are always good, especially colors. And if you have a school whose colors are, are, are gold and, and blue, uh, show them Albury. They love that. And some bright clusters as well. For advanced groups, then you can go into faint deep sky objects like galaxies. But this would be for maybe high school or college level. And then you can throw in some bonus objects. Uh, a major comet, which we haven't had since the 1990s now. We're due. Um, just one thing I remember, when Hale Bopp was in the sky, I pointed out to the group, and as I did, a meteor shot across the, across the sky, and the parents said, how'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> but meteor showers are another one, if the person's around or something like that. In addition, I, mean, I know Rich is big on this, if there are any bright satellites going across the sky, or the International Space Station, or Iridium Flare, and I usually go to uh, Heavens Above, before the session just to see what might be out there. And it's always interesting just to point out a satellite or something. Some of them have never seen anything like that. Next. Some star party do's and don'ts. Do include the moon. I'm going to stomp my foot. I go crazy. Yeah. You gotta have, if you're doing a star party, you better have the moon in there. And I, just from experience, I've done, the schools always pick the night sometimes. And we have some issues with that. They'll pick a night that the, it's, it's a new moon, which is great for Mario, but the kids don't know where to look. I don't know how many, I, and I had, did one star party where the best thing we could start with was Jupiter. And kid after kid, you know, I had to give them about five minutes just to, you no, know, okay. It took me about five minutes for each kid to finally see what was going on because they just didn't know where to place their eye. If you get the moon in there, the moon lights up the eyepiece, so right away there's a guide that can find their way to the eyepiece. And the other thing, it's a wow object. We, yeah, we hate the moon, but for a person that's never looked through a telescope, the moon just blows them away. And I love that little third grader going, wow. I also like to remind them that if they do well in math and science, they'll be up there when they're in their 30s. <laughs> so do include the moon. It's easy for the untrained eye to pick up, and it's a definite wow sight. Next. More do's and don'ts. 
Do use eyepieces that provide comfortable eye relief and a reasonably wide field of view. Use an intermediate magnification so the target object remains in the field of view. That is one reason why Jupiter looks smaller than they'd like. If I use the real high power, Jupiter is going to move out of that field of view, and every person that comes up, I'm going to have to re-aim the telescope. Emphasize the fact that you're using a modest power, and typically I'll use 50 to 150 power max. Not the gazillion they think is needed. And I do, that's one thing I try to get across to the parents as well. We're not using 500 power, we're using maybe 100, because they always ask, what's the power here? And I'll say, maybe 100 power, which you can get with a small backyard telescope. Uh, use good quality eyepieces, but not your most expensive one. You don't want peanut butter and jelly all over an angler eyepiece. Next, some more do's and points, uh, don'ts. Do limit boredom by pointing out bright naked eye objects or binocular targets to attend these weight in line. That's why I like to have the adults bring binoculars. If it's a winter study, you might point out the Pleiades and just invite people who have binoculars to check out the Pleiades while they're waiting to get their chance to view through the telescope. And uh, I'll always be pointing out things in the sky just to the people that are waiting in line to look through the telescope. Next. More do's and don'ts. Don't give long-winded lectures during the star party. Instead, spice up the event with quick, fascinating facts. One I like, uh, instead of telling a group of high school seniors that Sirius is eight light years away, inform them that the light reaching their eyes left when they were in fourth grade. That always blows them away. It's just about the distance of things. The Andromeda Galaxy, you're talking about before the Ice Age when there were still mammoths walking around here. So you can talk about events that happened when the light left that particular star instead of saying it's how many light years away, distances, things like that. What I usually use, and I don't remember the exact figures, but if you're looking at Jupiter, and I just fall, I think it's about 45 light minutes away, give or take. So if we're about 45 minutes to the star party, I'll tell them that the light that left Jupiter started when we just began the star party. And that always blows in mind, you're going 400 plus million miles away in the, in the period of just one star party. So little facts like that. On the moon, again, I'll tell a little third grader, you could be up there in 20, 30 years if you pay attention in science and math. Next. Some more star party do's and don'ts. Don't try to impress your audience with your equipment. Now this may affect some people, but we were invited to, uh, when there's an eclipse of the moon at the Science Museum, we're invited to show up with our telescopes. And I brought a little four and a half inch uh, reflecting telescope, tiny little thing. And I couldn't believe the gear people had, wires and gadgets and gizmos, huge. Of course, the people were drawn to these giant telescopes. I couldn't get anybody to look in that little tin can I had. I was finally collaring people, come over and look through this. The reason is that what the people are gonna be impressed with is that I need thousands of dollars if I wanna see the moon or the, the, crater, or the craters on the moon or Saturn's rings. And what happened was finally, I noticed Saturn right near the Zaycom Bridge. And I pulled the telescope over, named it at Saturn, I called some people over, and they were excited. They were amazed you could see the rings of Saturn, that little telescope that they could afford for about $150, not the $10,000 telescopes that were there. So as far as yes, this is probably ideal, a six inch, maybe a six inch dog, pair of binoculars. Uh, yeah, they'll be impressed, but they're going to go home thinking, well, that's it, I'll never see these things again because I, don't, I can't afford that telescope. I find that, you, when I, and I'll be honest, when I do a star party by myself, I bring a 10-inch dog, which is getting a little on the big side, but I also bring that little four and a half inch scope, and it's so user-friendly that I give a quick demonstration to kids how to aim it and what to look for, and then I let them go on that telescope while they're waiting to look for the bigger scope. I want that audience to leave knowing that this is within reach of them. They don't need expensive equipment. Next. This is a fun activity I've been doing recent years. Uh, I bring that little four and a half inch telescope and I show them how to take a, a red standard smartphone and take a picture of the moon with it. it takes a little patience because there's a sweet spot, but the kids can usually do it. So I have that four and a half inch scope set up. They're with it. It's with them. They can work it the way they want. I'm over with a 10-inch doing whatever I'm doing. And the kids have come over and they'll show me a picture of the moon that they got with their cell phone. And when I was a kid that age, you had to have a 35-millimeter camera, all this, which I never did. And I didn't ever take a picture of the moon until a couple of years ago with my smartphone, 40 years after I started. So I'll tell the kids, it took me 40 years to take my first picture of the moon. You did it in 40 minutes. 
So that is a kind of a nice thing for the kids. They get a kick out of that. Again, that's why I like the moon in the sky. Preferably about a three-day-old moon. You know, anything closer to new moon, it might be lost in the treetops as the star party gets going. But about a three-day-old day old moon to maybe a couple days before full. I had some more star party do's and don'ts. Do give a handout. Could be a resource list and a club card. We had some club cards print out, and I'd certainly encourage any of you to do a star party to have some of the Atmob cards to hand out to adults, maybe. You might even get us some new members. Uh, next, uh, these are some things that uh, Rich added. Uh, we talked about some of the resources we have as far as handouts, and there are two of them that are pretty good. One is from the Abrams Planetarium. It's a monthly sky calendar. One side, and I love this, this is day-by-day day drawings of what's in the sky, what you can look for, day-by-day. Day. And then, of course, there's a standard sky view, what's up there in the sky. Now, this you have to subscribe to. It's about $12 a year, which isn't bad. It comes in, uh, you get three, it's quarterly, so you get three issues uh, every uh, couple of months. And it's a wonderful thing to just, you can print these things out and give them out to people in your group. Next. If you want to go with freebies, there's sky maps. You can get right off the internet. You can print out the charge stuff. You got them right there. So yep. check with Bruce. He'll show you. And uh, again, it's got the all sky map. And then it's got lists of events and things you can see. It's not as detailed as the Abrams one as far as events, but you can look different things. You can see naked eye, binoculars, telescopic objects. So both of these are great. Yes? It is as detailed as the other one, but the other one is visual. If you go okay, back. yeah. It shows what you're going to see, and it gives a little summary off to the side. When you go to the other one, yeah, the are, things yeah. that you're going to see are listed verbally there. So if you if you get the two of them, you cover the verbal folks, you cover the visual folks, and this one has the what you can see during the month, which is great because that's the first question you get from these folks when they got a new telescope. Some of them bring a telescope to the star mm -hmm. party. This will tell you, okay, you can go see these things. I do try to really have people leave knowing, like if we looked at Mizar, for instance, the Big Dipper, I'll just remember, there's a Big Dipper. When you go home, uh, if you have a telescope of your own that you didn't bring, check it out, look for that double star. Next. Uh, I'm going, okay, so this you're taking over now, right? Yep. Star party training. All right, Rich is taking you, Laura? Come on, Laura. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's nice go. I've never used one of these before. Usually when I give these talks, my wife can hear me back in towns and mess, so I don't know if I need it. Right? <laughs> my Some of these are animations, so how about if I stand up? So you're pushing just the uh, end button. We're lucky. So, um, this is a pretty bright slide. I think we're all set. This is Laura Saylor. Laura's one of our star party coordinators. I'm Rich Nugent, of course, you all know me by now. Um, I uh, sort of run the outreach committee. So we're not gonna spend too, too much time here. A lot of what Glenn said is uh, uh, here again. Um, and so what I wanted to do is to start with Laura to tell us. Laura ran a nice um, star party training uh, uh, event uh, up at the clubhouse back uh, in August. And it was uh, attended by about, what do you think, about 15 people, club members, a few newbies and some veterans. And we, we talked about um, all sorts of stuff. Um, and I, I titled it, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Star Parties, But We're Afraid to Ask. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna see how this plays out. This looks a little different than when I looked this afternoon, mm -hmm. but here, why don't you go ahead, you can talk. All right. You wanna talk about this? Nope, you have it. Right. Um, so basically the first thing we wanna know is to everybody in here, especially the new faces, um, the number one thing that I found that happens at the clubhouse is the star party. So you come in there and you're a newbie, and you're a new member and you, you're not quite sure what to do. So really what we wanted to do is start with the newbies and we found the star parties were a good way to engage, right? Because a three-year-old, they can ask you questions that will blow you away, but at least by the next one you get better and better and better. So what we wanted to do is make the star party thing more accessible to the newbies as well as to the old members so that we could get the, or I would say the seasoned members, so that they could um, help the newbies get the facts together, get the excitement together, and feel like you're confident enough to, to participate. So the first message you out is, how do you schedule a star party? Um, first of all, the first place you go is to the website. 
go to the website that Chris has, go to the corner that says Star Parties, open it up, and you can see the schedule of what's there. So the problem is they're not all yet there yet because the schools call you and they write you and we, what we really need, and Bernie's not here, right? Bernie's not here. So what we've been trying to do is to get all of the members to reach back out to your schools and show them that, you know, hey, if you're interested, it doesn't take, you don't have to have a lot of details. Just reach out to a teacher and tell them, hey, did you know this resource is out there? Once they come in, just send them to the website, they should be able to go to, Another uh, there are a lot of buttons. But yeah. <laughs> um, so how do you schedule it? So basically there's a form on the website that Maria and those guys have all put together and all they have to do is fill that out and it shows them the kind of questions sure. that they need to know. Like what sort of equipment do they need? You know, what do you need to bring for, you know, what do you need to know your telescope? Where, you know, the bug spray, what size, what age of kids, how long does it have to be, and all the, you know, basically we help prep them up front of what they're going to be expecting to look at because most of the teachers are trying to teach a class anyway. We did a wonderful one last year. I don't remember where it was. Some academy. Oh, up up. In, oh, the Faye. It was the Faye school. Yeah. And they, the kids were prepped. So they had a lot of activities. They made a little scope before and all that. But really all we try to do is interact with the teacher that's running it or the community member so they know what's going on. Now for the newbies, it's a great time for you to hear and watch how it goes. So you don't need to bring anything, right? Just come with your body, just come. This is the club house thing. The, this is, um, no, this is even once they come to a start, right? Mm -hmm. right? So just show up. So go to the calendar, pick one, show up. Once you get there, we'll guide you through it. You don't have to have the responsibility for having your school for everything right away. Just pretend you're one of the kids and pop through. Um, how do you survive outside? I'll let you tell them about all this stuff. Well, these are some of the things we talked about, and a lot of the stuff was covered by Glenn already, but, you know, the how to schedule a star party is what Laura just talked about, and what sort of equipment should you bring. Uh, more and more, I, I tell folks that we should, like Glenn suggested, we, we stick with relatively small telescopes. You know, A, it's very hard to drag a giant telescope to the star party and set it up, but you don't want to give the wrong impression. You want people to think that this is something that, astronomy, that it's something that they could actually afford to get involved in. And so sometimes the smaller pieces of equipment actually work out better. Um, they always ask the magnification. They always ask about magnification. They also ask how much does the telescope cost. So I, I be on, I'm honest with them, and I, the magnification is easy. Um, what well, something Glenn said about using not, you know inexpensive eyepieces. You're right. I've said it before here. Sometimes your eyepieces, you'll come back from a star party. It looks like the kids were licking this, the eyepieces. <laughs> so they look at me. They're sticky and they're gooey, and there's like kids lick on them. You know, it's something they're awful. So yeah, I leave the ethos eyepieces at home. But one of the eyepieces I recently acquired. Um, I was talking to Al about it one night, and um, I, I got my hands on a, uh, an, eight, an 8 to 24 millimeter zoom eyepiece, which I find is, is just fantastic to bring to star parties. Um, I don't have to change the eyepiece. I can frame up the object I want uh, just the way I think it looks the most beautiful. And it, it's really a convenient sort of thing to, to drag to a star party. Um, so that, that's what I've been using. Um, I, again, a few facts about the objects you're looking at. They want to know how far away it is. They especially want to know how far away it is. Um, they'll ask you questions. It's okay to say you don't know. It's okay to say, oh, gosh, I don't even know. That's my homework. Um, uh, how Some do you of us cheat. So I have to admit, for the newbies, um, you know, you can get really overwhelmed, especially when you're listening to Glenn and Steve and those guys. But I use Redshift. So while they're in between and they're in all these little bodies are everywhere. And you have... You, the other thing we need is a lot of volunteers, right? It doesn't matter. Just come out for the fun and bring your scope because they're always around. But the Redshift is a program that's on your phone, and there's another one that, that someone uses. I use their Stellarium. I use Sky Safari. And um, while they're running around like crazy, you can totally get their attention because you can put that up and they can see it, and it gives them time when they're in line to figure out where everything really is what, so when they get to the scope. So again, I would say, you know, I cheat a lot because I don't know, but the idea of the star party training, if you want to come to them, which we're going to hold another one hopefully in October, then um, we'll give you uh, something to study or bring your favorite one and talk to the veterans in the club and they'll give you the little facts that you need. Glenn's very good. All these guys are great about Just pick the one that you're most interested in. Hopefully it'll be that sky that night. I tend to love the moon. It's easy. You're always impressed. 
<laughs> it's okay. I like the moon too. Yeah, we always do the moon. So we like the moon to come up to star parties. Though. Well, you know, <laughs> you're right. Um, we do. We look at all kinds of cool things at star parties, and uh, you, know, you don't have to be a you don't have to be a veteran. It's just it's just come on out and you, you, you'll just fall right into it. I like to cheat with my sky safari um, on the phone. If somebody asks me a question, I'll just quick look it up. Yeah. You know. Um, That's what Bob does too. Bob too. Yeah, Bob's right. Where's Bob? I saw him tonight. He's right over yeah. there. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There he is. Like, uh, he showed me how to do it. I look like a genius that first night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's not a secret too. I I like to. Show oh, I do too. Oh, sure. Oh. If you have questions, you can learn. It's a beautiful program. I love it. So for the newbies, that's Corey. You should find him. He's got a fun table. Every single time he's got something new there, he's got this thing that you can watch on the ground. Um, so again, for the new people who aren't really comfortable yet and want to come out and just start to figure it out, go hang out at Corey's table. Corey's table looks like a swap table. Yes. Because there's so much stuff on it. You're going to get and you're at swap table. Bare minimum. They have binoculars and the kids love those. They're always shot though. You can see they have some field, long field ones, whatever. Do dress, wa dress warm. I went to my first star party and I almost died. Um, it was so cold. And then I think the next one I got bit by the uh, bugs. So, um, I tell people as far as dr dr dressing warm with the star yeah. parties that, you know, even in August, if you have a star party in August and it was 80 degrees in the afternoon, it gets pretty cold at night. Well, you're out there on a March evening and it's a balmy 40 degrees and you're going to stand there for three hours. I tell people to make sure that you uh, you dress as if you were going on an Arctic expedition because it gets really cold out there. But we all know that, you know. But but, but you got to be reminded sometimes it gets pretty cold out there. And the teachers and the and the people that organize and start parties sometimes they forget to remind the kids. So nothing's worse than having to take your coat off and give it to a kid because you're still freezing to death, but they're even colder. So if you are organizing one and there is a form that we send them, but at the last minute just always remind them. Because it does get colder than I think. They go to the bathroom before the start party starts too, because sometimes you're out there for three hours and you really can't break. There's no break. What else am I going on here? What does that say? Best oh, what's the best thing to a start party? Of course, the one said, your enthusiasm, of course. Um, they love it when you're just very enthusiastic and very outgoing and, and very, and you don't even have to be super knowledgeable, but you come across, you're the expert, right? You're the expert at these star parties. And, and some, here are some of the upcoming events that we've got. The Mount Wade Star Party in Malden is coming up on October 13th. That was rescheduled from, Bob, was that back in March? Spring, sometime. Sometime in the spring, they could have out. Sometime when it was really bad weather, which could have been any time. It could have been any day of the week. <laughs> um, the Pop Scout folks are going to be at that one as well, but uh, Glenn and I are going to uh, uh, have had a Cub Scout pack at Dunstable Mass in October. We we'll already said you wanted to go to that one too, right? And then the, the Acton Box for a Star Party, that's a big one, November 5th. That's a, that's a, a well-attended Star Party. You, you might get 400 people to come to that star party. And what I always try to do, and Glenn mentioned it, you know, we try to ask the school up front how many people are going to be there so we can have enough telescopes. There's nothing worse than having a line that's 45 minutes long and they're going to get a 10 second look at something. So we always try to have enough telescopes to go around. We always try to assign objects so that, well, I just waited in line for half an hour to see Saturn again. You know, they, they, they want to see different things. So we, we try to assign different uh, telescopes to folks. And this is a new one, the, the Vinning Elementary School. Just came up the other day. We haven't even publicized that one yet. That's coming up. Um, so that's an interesting, the Acton Foxborough, they go to the seventh grade, so they've changed their curriculum. Before, I think it was third or fourth graders. Yep. This should be a fun uh, show with kids that are much more into it, potentially. Yeah, seventh graders, they'll, they'll probably be pretty into it. Uh, there's, another, there's another star party in Acton that we, we did in March. But it's it's, Parker, dip, it's different. Parker, it's, right? The the Parker, Damien Parker yeah. building. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where those all those kids came from, but a lot of people yeah. showed up to that. Holy cow! That was that was that was a big crowd. I get to be the greeter in the front. Just you know, make, I make them look. Yeah, I said the admission of the star party is whatever you got to pay your admission. That's to look through this telescope, and then make them look through the telescope. Come on, I'm just going to throw this out. One of the cases where you unfortunately you are really hugely outnumbered. If I have like 30 people that have been waiting a long time, I usually try to feel like who's ha who hasn't seen the moon yet. And when I get the last particular, it's usually a parent with some kids, and they're the last ones in line, I let them be the first in line for the next object just to make up for them having to wait the last yeah. time. Yeah, and don't, don't forget to let the teachers look through the telescopes as well. They're the ones that almost never get to look through telescopes in the star party. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, moving forward, there are other ways you can get involved. The pop scope people, nobody here tonight, I, asked, I invited them to come, but it was kind of last minute. Um, Popscope is kind of a grass, let's see if this actually works. Playing animation, let's see if it actually works. 
It's kind of a grassroots um, effort uh, in Boston and a number of other cities across North America um, where um, it's usually college graduate students that have an interest in astronomy. They're inner city, they, uh, the Boston group likes to go to the Children's Museum, um, they're going to the Mount Wade Star Party. They set up, they just show up and set up a little telescope and let people look through it. And it's, um, it's a nice little program, um, especially if you live in, here in the city. Um, if you were to try to lug a telescope in, my fear is that we're like park, you know, we're like safe, it's, you know, this kind of thing. Um, I would probably Uber my telescope in. And rather than try to find a parking place, I'd Uber the scope in with me and I'd Uber back out again. You can get an app, it's on your phone, you can do it. Um, they, that's what they do. And so we can get, we can get involved in PopScope, we, you know, they, they, they're their own entity, but we can certainly support those guys. Um, they, that seems to be a worthy cause. Um, the Library Telescope Program in Massachusetts, <laughs> the next couple of slides that I've got um, come from the Aldrich Astronomical folks. Um, uh, I talked with John Root, who is the director of this program for the Aldrich. He, um, he was a little reluctant to give me these slides. These slides came from Jim Zabrowski, who's a NASA ambassador, he's the president of the Aldrich Club right now. And it's very high, it's highly animated, so let's see if this actually works. <laughs> let's see if it works. So, uh, based on the one started by the New Hampshire group, if there was any organization that should own this project, it's the New Hampshire Astronomical Society. They have distributed hundreds of telescopes into the library systems. And the group out at all, same deal. There are over 100 telescopes in libraries. You can go on their website and put your zip code in, and they'll, it'll, it'll come up the, within five miles all the telescopes they've given. Now, they don't have a lock on this program, um, and if, if it's something that the club wanted to do, we could, you know, we could institute this and have that. Great volunteer activity, um, support for scouts and scout leaders, library <coughs> telescopes are awesome. Uh, the modified telescopes are very rugged, require minimal service. Um, and this stat, only 12 telescopes required minor maintenance. I don't know what that means, but you know, out of 147 uh, scopes. So they're, they're pretty durable. And um, staff training is important, and the Orion four and a half inch telescope is what they use. Um, and they give talks as well. Um, a, a Sky and Telescope has, uh, if you go to a Sky and Telescope, or just go on a Google search and go, library uh, loaner program, Sky and Telescope. Um, the, a nice article comes up that they published a while back. And I, I, I snatched the slide for them just to show you the modifications that are made. They put strings on the caps so that they can't be lost. They, um, they cut a hole in the, in the front cap of the telescope as a sort of a, an aperture mask to reduce the bright moonlight. They, they put a battery pack on the finder, number three. Uh, that's just a, a red dot finder. Number four and five, five is a zoom eyepiece that number four they bolted into place <laughs> so that nobody can take it out. And um, six are warning stickers about not looking at the sun <laughs> and sponsors and who put that telescope together. The whole, the whole cost of the, 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 um, the library telescope itself uh, is about, uh, 400, about 400 bucks. Let's see if this actually works, what is this? This is probably just more of the same. The, the hard part is that what they, what they do out at Aldrich very well, the guy I talked to, John Root, reminded me a lot of Charlie McDonald. And he's like a bear. He goes in to get money from a, a sponsor. He, he doesn't leave until they promise they'll give money. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, finding donors, doing the presentations. Um, members oftentimes uh, are assigned a telescope. If, you, if, we was, if this is something we want to get involved in, and I lived in Framingham, I might volunteer to be the guy in Framingham that goes and maintains the telescope every now and again. Um, it doesn't, it's not a lot of work, but anyway, I'm gonna just let this run. And the cost is about $375. And that includes a tote, a pillow. It's <laughs> they have quite a system. But here are other ways to get involved. I mean, you can teach a course at your local, um, uh, local adult education. Bob, you're doing that uh, over in Groton, right? I did it in the spring and I'm doing it again this fall. Yep. So there are, there are lots of ways you can get involved. You can give presentations at libraries or community centers in your town. You can volunteer to help with your local school's astronomy program. If you're going into the school, you might have to be quarried uh, these days, but that's simple. Um, share, your love of astronomy, share your love of astronomy with everyone. My mail carrier has seen more cool stuff than, than anybody else she knows. Because every time I've got a telescope set up in the drive, make sure you lose the mail. I'd make her come and look through the telescope. I always, I always make her. My neighbors don't know how lucky they are. Um, and then get involved at the Atmob Outreach Program, and that's easy. Um, you can get involved by contacting anybody on the committee. It's Laura, 
me, Bernie Kosecki, John Harrington, uh, and Glenn Chapel are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. You can reach us at Star Party, uh, at MOB at starparty.org, and, um, or you can come up and talk to us after the meeting, and we'll, we'll fill you all in. What's that? Star Party at MOB.org. Oh, is, that, is it backwards? Is it backwards? No wonder they don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Although well, starparty.org is available, we should grab it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Well, like I said, these slides didn't format the right way, so you know, it's like, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Maria. And for newbies um, and anybody that you know that's talked about it but is afraid to come, just have them write us directly. Um, we are planning another training when it's always hard to get all the newbies at the same time, um, but it doesn't matter if you can do multiple ones. And on Saturdays, it's always easy because there's people at the clubhouse. And they, again, reassure them they don't have to bring their own equipment. They can just start, you know, come take little little baby steps till they get there. Um, yeah, I think we will be putting a note out to people when we do have the big star parties because we, need, we do need more volunteers. So there's always a good core of people that we can count on, but we do need more people. Um, and so you'll see quite a bit of a burst of time when these next months come through because there's quite a few that come through. I'd say November, October, November, but again, we had a lot in the spring. Yeah, we get a lot of them in the springtime. So. You know, here's the bottom line. You know, we, we, we do have an outreach committee and we do like to do outreach, but it's it's whatever we, the membership, want to do. We don't have, we can do any of this or none of it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, but what it does take is our, our volunteers to help out. So, um, you know, try to get involved. If, it, if it's not your thing, then don't worry about it. If you, if you think it's something you might like to try, then come and talk with us and we'll get, we'll, we'll get you started. It's, I, I love them. It's a blast. I have more fun. Sometimes they actually feed us. They, we have, it's really some pretty good food. But, I mean, what's the school that has all that chili they feed us? Acton. That's the Acton. That's the Damien, the uh, Parker School, right? Yeah. They have this giant spread of food when it's over. It's awesome. They gave us little presents for going there last year. It's really awesome. And um, yeah, so it's kind of fun. I, 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 I enjoy doing them. But again, you know, we, it, it takes a village. And so um, if you're interested, let, get, let us know, and we'll do what we can do, and we, we won't do what we can't. Oh my gosh, yeah, thank you very much. It's it's um, um, it, it's not a lot of work, but it's a commitment. You know, coming out and you know taking time from away from your your world um, to give back some of this uh, cool astronomy stuff to the general public. Um, if we, my only complaint is we haven't advertised us enough at star parties. I want to you know with these handouts. I want you know. The, business cards or whatever we've got, some sort of a handout that we have hand, hand to the adults to say like, we're the image telescope makers of Boston because we come and we go. And I don't think people recognize that we're actually there. We don't get a lot of press sometimes at star parties. And that might bolster the membership, you know? And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of young families out there. And, you know, it, it, it's a, a, a vast supply of new members potentially, so. All right, I guess that's all we have, right? Thanks, Laura. Thank you, guys. Thanks. folks um, thanks it's, uh, to the committee to doing an outstanding job this is you know part of my platform as a new president I think outreach is is really important to me I've been involved in, with the star parties since I joined I think it was 1993 or something so it's, a, it's an absolute blast and I always learn more than the kids do so um, please encourage everyone to come out it's, it's a lot of fun the one thing that wasn't mentioned is we've seen star parties wax and wane, and a lot of that is because some of the key members of our organization don't play as big a role as they used to, but a lot of it is that teachers wax and wane. Some retire, some move on, they do different things, and oftentimes we have champions at different school systems that really drive these events. So I think one of the things we need to do is um, reach out to school systems and say, hey, we do this stuff. We can help you put together a curriculum, those types of things. So if anyone's interested, you, you are connected with a school system, you'd be interested in helping a sponsor that that knowledge um, transfer, that would be fantastic, I think. So um, again, it's a great committee, a lot of fun, very dynamic, so I'm excited about it. So thank you very much. And with that.